So in this lecture, we're going to um, look a little bit more at uh, thermodynamic products and kinetic products just a little bit. Um, and so what I want to emphasize is that um, uh, the application of heat um, can allow us to access uh, us um, access to thermodynamic products. if the reaction is reversible. Now, this is interesting because if you recall, the thermal product is the exoproduct, but the exoproduct is not the kinetic product. That's the endoproduct. But it turns out the Diels-Alder reaction is reversible by way of a retro Diels-Alder reaction. So the Diels-Alder reaction is reversible through a retro Diels-Alder reaction. So retro means uh, going backwards. So what this suggests is that we could take a cyclohexene of some sort and heat it up a lot, and we would actually undergo a retro Diels-Alder reaction where the arrows go in the reverse direction. Whoops, not there. Goodness. So we would go here, here, and here, and that would give rise to a diene plus a dienophile. And this is a retro DA reaction. Well, what you can do then is if you heat the reaction up, if you heat a Diels-Alder product up that is endo, and it's endo because our stuff is cis to our outward facing methyl groups. If this is the endo product, what you can do is if you heat this up like crazy, we'll undergo a retro Diels-Alder reaction. To give rise to this plus our stuff. So these are just the DA starting materials. And they could go back and do another Diels-Alder reaction to make the endo product. But there's an equilibrium that now has been achieved by application of a lot of heat. Not only is there an equilibrium there to forming the starting materials, but we can also access the equilibrium, which is far less favorable towards the retro Diels-Alder products to give rise to the exoproduct, where we would form a product where our stuff is now trans to the methyl groups. So the exoproduct gets formed by the application of heat onto the endo product. Similarly, if we just started with our diene and dienophile and add way more heat than we needed to, we would actually um, accomplish two things. First of all, any endo product that's formed would be formed in, re in a reversible equilibrium that it could go back to the starting material. So endo, starting material, endo, starting material, endo, starting material. And then every once in a while, go down to the exo because some of the material is going to have the energy to overcome the exo activation energy, go on to the exo, that equilibrium is not as favorable. So it's going to be more likely to stay at the more stable exo product than the diene and the dienophile would um, be formed compared to the endo going back to the diene and dienophile. Okay, so we kind of have these two competing equilibriums. I guess I was going this way. Gosh, this is really hard hand motion to do. Um, and the one atop up top with the endo equilibrium, that's more likely to occur than the one down at the bottom, the exo um, equilibrium because the exo product is more stable and it's lower in energy. So it's reverse reaction has a higher hill to climb. 
So that's one aspect. The other thing that you do is if you have energy barriers that differ by this much, where this might be the higher exo activation energy, this one, the lower endo that we talked about, um, you actually compress them a little bit closer to together at higher temperatures. Okay, so now you have the energy to overcome the activation barrier to make the exo product, and um, you can revert the endo product back to the starting materials and then give rise to the exo product. So interesting application. Just by applying heat, we can, in, we can kind of overcome the endo rule. I could capture some of that in notes. So applying heat allows exo products to form by way of a retro deals alder reaction. Okay. Um, by way of a retro deals alder reaction. And then there's some other things in there. What's pretty cool is if we take, um, we, we can actually use this to our advantage for a particularly important case. I talked about the cyclopentadiene, uh, cyclopentadiene as a um, diene, and it's a great diene for reasons that will, um, we, can, we can actually just talk about right now. It's a great diene um, because it is locked in the S cis conformation. It can't undergo free rotation over this bond. There's no free rotation here. So it's never in the S trans or unreactive conformation. It's never S trans. Um, and so it's actually a wonderful dyne. Now, it turns out that it's too good of a dyne what does that mean? Well, it actually reacts with itself. So I can't, I can't go into um, the chemical suppliers and buy cyclopentadiene because it reacts too well with itself. It reacts too well, so well that it reacts with itself. So it reacts with itself by way of a Diels Alder reaction. It's kind of interesting. That is the fact that it's locked in the S trans conformation means that it will find any alkene that it can get its hands on to do a Diels Alder reaction. So that means it could grab an alkene of itself. So I have a cyclopentadiene reacting with a cyclopentadiene to make a dimer. It's like a polymer, but with two groups, a dimer of cyclopentadiene Now, what's cool about this is this group right here is actually endo. I'll let you prove that to yourself. But anyway, cyclopentadiene reacts with itself in a Diels Alder reaction. And that makes an interesting molecule called dicyclopentadiene. So it makes dicyclopentadiene, the dimer of cyclopentadiene. Okay, now as I alluded to, cyclopentadiene does this because it's such a good dienophile, or such a good diene, that it will find itself as a dienophile and then it follows the endo rule and it makes dicyclopentadiene. But what do we do then if we want cyclopentadiene? If we want that starting structure because it makes that interesting CH2 bridge and, it, and it's such a wonderful diene, well, we have to crack cyclopentadiene, dicyclopentadiene. So let me rephrase that. To get access to cyclopentadiene, which is this, we need to, the quote, uh, crack, which is break apart, dicyclopentadiene. And what I mean by that is we need to take advantage of the opportunities for Diels-Alder reactions to revert by way of a retro Diels-Alder reaction 
back to the starting materials. So this is a solid. And if we apply a great deal of heat to it, we will undergo a retro Diels Alder reaction where we go here to here to here. to give rise to this plus this. Maybe I should, I'm gonna redraw those double bonds so they're a little bit easier to see. Okay, so those are our two starting materials and these have a lower boiling point. So what's cool about this, we used to do this in organic too, but it would just take a while for the lab to get pulled off because you have to start the dicyclopentadiene cracker plus the Diels Alder reaction we do right now is way cooler. Um, but when I started, we'd buy some dicyclopentadiene, get it into a flask and heat, heat it like crazy. Um, not, um, and we would melt the dicyclopentadiene. When it melted, it would start to continue to be heated. And if you kept the heat just right so we didn't boil the dicyclopentadiene, it would crack in half to cyclopentadiene, monocyclopentadiene. Um, and that monocyclopentadiene, which I show as having a lower BP or a lower boiling point, that's a, do a better job writing the letter P, um, that would boil in a distillation event. And we would just capture that with a condenser and collect it into a flask. And we would have some cyclopentadiene, not the dicyclopentadiene, but the little five-membered ring with two double bonds. We'd have that so that we could do experiments on it. It wouldn't hang around long because it's such a good dying that it would find itself as a dienophile and make the dicyclopentadiene. So we would capture it, keep it cold, and, to, and then use it for, we'd have about the afternoon to use it however we saw fit, whether that was a Diels Alder reaction or something else um, before it would go back. Now what I want to um, just mention is that um, that's an example of great dying because it's fixed in that S, train, uh, S cis conformation. But um, if we compare that, and, and as a result, if we compare that to our normal alkenes, it reacts faster. So, and that's because we have this equilibrium where we have um, active and inactive or unreactive conformers. So it's really only this that can undergo a reaction so cyclopentadiene being fixed in the S, trans, uh, S cis conformation, I don't know why I keep saying trans, um, is better than a normal alkene, which has to fight with its conformer equilibrium population of S trans conformation. But that's infinitely faster than if we fix a diene in the S trans conformation. So if you had a diene like this, yes, it's a diene, but it's actually completely unreactive because we have fixed in S trans. We fixed it in the S trans conformation, whereas down here we're fixed in the S cis. Now we'll talk more about some other ways for activating um, Diels-Alder dienes and dienophiles in um, future units, but um, let's just stick for this as a definition for um, good reacting and poor reacting um, dienes and dienophiles. Okay, so um, next lecture we'll look at, uh, I believe finally, sorry to tease it before, but I believe finally the last unit of the last video of the Diels-Alder reaction.